Good afternoon and welcome to the British Society of Gerontology Special Interest Group on Aging, Business and Society Workshop. How can gerontologists and business work together to enable the decade of healthy aging? I'm Rob Walton, I'm Deputy Chair of the SIG and on behalf of everyone who's prepared today's workshop, we're delighted that so many of you have been able to come along to join us and share your views on this important topic. Through its work and in pursuit of its mission, the SIG is uniquely placed to, uh, the SIG is uniquely placed to ask three critical questions of ourselves and our community and our society. How can we empower social gerontology to work effectively in and within business? How can we support business to better understand older people and aging? And how can gerontology and business work together to enable the WHO decade of healthy aging? We're gonna to continue today to explore these questions, starting with this, our third workshop in the series, with what we hope will be an exciting, inclusive and conclusive series of events that help us to think strategically about opportunities, challenges, solutions, best practices, and of course, impact. As this is the third in the series, I'll tell you a little bit more about what is coming up uh, over the rest of the next few months and what we're gonna do with all the information that we've gathered through these sessions. But first, uh, a word from our sponsor. Um, I'm just struggling a little bit with my... I'd like to thank the UK Research and Innovation uh, for supporting the British Society of Gerontology Special Interest Group on Aging Society, Business and Society. But first, let's get down to business. This afternoon, we'll hear from longevity leaders who are passionate about partnerships and passionate about the decade of elderly aging. It is our hope that we address and explore what it means to support gerontology and business to partner for mutual benefit, why it's important and how we working together can really make a difference. Leading us through our session are our facilitators, Professor Mario Barbagallo, President of IAGG ER, uh, David Sinclair, Director of International Longevity Center, Susan Weil Schwartz, uh, Director of Communications of the Global Coalition on Aging, Natalie Elmit, UK Policy Lead for, for Home Instead, and Ian Felt, founder of Age Care Technologies and the chair of the SIG. I'm also pleased to introduce Catherine Foote, Director of Phoenix Insights, who will join us later to help us through the breakout groups and provide uh, observations as principal discussion in our panel. Before I hand over to Mario, our first speaker, just a few housekeeping points. Please, uh, this is a workshop, and so we're very keen to hear your views. The meeting is recorded, and we've been able both audio and video for all delegates. Please do be respectful of other participants, keeping your microphones and cameras switched off until you wish to speak. Later in the meeting, we're gonna split out into breakout groups with four to choose from covering four key areas please decide for yourselves which room, oh, we've already allocated rooms. So if you get stuck, uh, please come back to the main room uh, and let us, let us know uh, if you've not got into your breakout room and we'll help you to get to the right breakout room. And finally, just to emphasize, uh, this event is down to all of us. And so please participate fully, bring your energy, bring your head and your heart, but most of all, bring your voice and bring your opinion. Thank you very much. And uh, Mario, over to you. The, the central thing is that uh, all back off okay. the process. Fe Fe thanks, Rob. Uh, uh, thanks, Jan. I, I want you, to, I want to thank. Uh, uh, Professor Yanfield for having organized this SIG on British uh, Society of Gerontology and uh, uh, as a president of International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics, I'm very happy uh, to be with you 
and uh, explain the role of EIGG in uh, uh, this contest. Uh, first of all, I would say that British, British Society of Gerontology, BSG, is partner, is part of, of EIGG, ER, that uh, has uh, almost uh, 42 members in Europe. And uh, EIGG uh, is ER is a partner, is an NGO, is a partner of uh, with WHO at the United Nations, and actually is is a stakeholder of United Nations, uh, with uh, uh, five people staying in in uh, United Nations to bring uh, 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 the proposal from uh, each of the society that belong to to uh, EIGG, including uh, BASG. So uh, this is because uh, w, uh, WHO, as, as you know, and, and uh, the assembly and also proposal for the decade of healthy aging 2020-2030, and this one was actually uh, uh, firstly in, endorsed by EIGG ER. Uh, the WHO decision was then transmitted to the Secretary General of the United Nations. What is this decade? Decade of healthy aging is, I do believe, is an important opportunity uh, to bring together governments, civil society, international agency, the academia, the media, this, this, the society, even the private sector is very important uh, in, in this contest uh, and for 10 years of concerted, catalytic and collaborative action to improve the, the uh, lives of older people, family, community in which they live. It's actually the objective of, of, of this seek. I, I have not the time uh, in this uh, uh, few minutes to discuss all, all the objective uh, of, of, the, um, uh, L, of this decade of heavy aging, but uh, just let me uh, uh, to remind what are the main pillar and the main, the main uh, um, goals of, of this uh, uh, 10 years uh, um, uh, healthy, uh, uh, healthy aging. We have to all optimize, we are trying to optimize five areas of functioning among older people over the next 10 years. First of all, the ability to meet one basic needs. Uh, and, and we have to think all, 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 over, all, all over the world because the number of older people uh, is increasing in in in, in uh, uh, not only in the western country but even more in the more in the more poor country uh, one of the objectives is just to decrease poverty to decrease poverty in the world so the first goal is the ability to meet one basic needs uh, the second is to be to learn to grow and to make decision so this is you you have, we, we also to think too many uh, disease of aging that may uh, alter the, the possibility and the ability to make to, to make decision. Mobility. Mobility is, is, is a main problem in, in, the, in the early, the ability to, 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 uh, to, uh, to move uh, um, in, in, independently is uh, one of the main objects we've, we've tried to I mean, reach in these 10 years. The, the ability to build and maintain, and maintain relationships. Uh, because the, the social uh, the social part uh, of uh, healthy aging is crucial not only is, uh, when when we, we, we talk about healthy aging we talk about uh, um, not not only about disease but we have to talk all, all the social interaction and to to increase the the the, uh, the possibility of older people to get uh, social interaction is crucial also it means also to to get an environment that that uh, would allow social relationship. And this is uh, very important for the older. And, and again, the ability to contribute because all the people, they, not only they, they deserve to get help, but they, they, they can contribute and they have to contribute because they still have a lot to, to give to the society. And uh, uh, so uh, we, we will address four, four areas of action to deliver person-centered integrated care and primary health service uh, responsive to older sessions. This is something we have to develop in, in, all, in, 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 in Western country, in more developed country and, and in less developed country. To provide access to long-term care. This is uh, also a, a, an important problem. And I know that HK technology uh, I, I'm sure that Professor Field will discuss about it. Is is uh, is uh, doing a, a great help in this in, in in partnership with WHO. 
So access to long-term care for older people who need it. Change the way we think, we feel, and to act toward age and aging. This is very, very important, in, in particular in some countries. Changing the way we think, we feel, and to act toward age. And to ensure the community foster the ability of older people, I discussed this before, because we, we, we get the community to get the, the uh, to help other people to foster their, their, their ability. I, this is a, 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 a lot of um, uh, problem we, have, we can do, discuss today in the last in, in the SIG. I just, uh, I, I want to stop here because I, I finished the, the five minutes of my, of my talk, but I know the discussion will be important on the theme of, of, of this, uh, of, uh, this uh, decade of healthy aging, 2020, 2030. Uh, thanks, Rob. We can. Uh, I think I, I I can pass the um, uh, um, the next speaker is David Sinclair. Is David around? Hi, David. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So we have, we have five mi five uh, minutes. Uh, uh, talk and then to, so we can give sure. two minutes for discussion. Great, great. So I'll be very, I'll try and be very brief. I suppose I want to talk briefly about what gerontologists can do to help businesses engage with with healthy aging and I think the three things I wanted to say is firstly you know there is absolutely a business case for engaging with you Secondly, though, engaging with businesses is, is hard and there are some real practical challenges. But I think thirdly, there are things you can do. So firstly, and I've just put an announcement in the chat. Um, so I thought I would use this opportunity to make this announcement. Really excited to announce we're about to launch a big program of work over 18 months to explore how retailers can engage with healthy aging. We really see this as an opportunity to promote your work and the sort of things that you're doing. <coughs> um, and, and the projects you're working on. So please, please come to us. Please also help us promote the advert and the links in there. And essentially what we want to do is support retailers to better understand the evidence about what healthy aging means. We want to, um, sorry, my other friend's ringing. Um, we want to inspire actions by retailers in relation to their role supporting healthy aging. And we want to actually transform how the retail sector sees older consumers. So for everyone online, I think there's lots of potentially interesting things to, to navigate, to be involved in. So um, we're, uh, yeah, please do share the job, think about applying. Uh, uh, coming back to sort of the, the three key points. Firstly, yes, ILC, we are the specialist think tank on longevity and its impact on society. And we are one of 16 across the world. It's worth saying uh, in, in terms of the, the first point, the, there is absolutely a business case for engagement between between academia, um, between the aging sector and between business. A really big priority for ILC UK is what, is what we've been calling the longevity dividend. So how do we make the most of the economic opportunity of aging? We know there's a really strong relationship between health and wealth and that if we keep people healthier for longer, they spend more, they care more, they volunteer more and they work longer. We've done lots and lots of work um, on this agenda and, and I, I don't think the jury's out anymore. I think it's really clear that there is a strong case for business and the economy to engage with older consumers and 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 people like you but that is really hard i think um you know um it, it's and it's particularly hard i think for academia it's it's hard to identify the right people in companies it's really hard to engage with them they don't they don't reply it's hard to find them um it's it's hard then and once you've actually even found them is is actually how the how, how do you actually get through to them how do you talk to them how do you get you know you're interested in redesigning um the high street to support um older consumers you know how do you get through to someone like ikea who might be able to make a difference and it's you know if you're you know stuck up i shouldn't meet i'm not being mean to pick on I don't know, edinburgh or sterling but if you're stuck up it's really hard to engage with some of these We're, because they're a long way away from physically and and actually you don't uh, uh, and I think linking on to the next barrier we don't always speak the same language you don't always you know uh, you know always you know um, saying the say things which you each understand and I think it's really important to try and work out how you get the sort of language that works um, from academic language into into industry um, 
but that is a challenge. I, I think there's a barrier in that actually it's hard for, you, for academia to know what you can do to help them. Um, and then I think there's also a bit of a barrier that retailers hear from an academic or indeed people like us and they perceive all you want is money from them. And I think there's a really interesting challenge about actually how you how you get over that. But actually to, to, to finish the last few minutes, I think, there, you know, there really are some practical things you, you can do. And I, I think, you know, firstly, and I would say this, you know, people... Um, People like through this group, people like Ian and Rob have some brilliant connections, really, really engaged. Use people like ILC to, to think about how you do the stakeholder mapping, how you get in touch with people. But, but at, at the heart, essentially, you need to be thinking about who do you want to reach and why do you want to reach them and what do you want to do? And if you can find if you can find answer to those, actually you can find answers to those challenges, you can actually get through to some really, really interesting and engaging people who ultimately, if we're, what we're talking about is turning the findings of your research into something that makes the high street look different, that makes business look different and respond differently, then, then actually there's a really, really exciting opportunity there. I think you've got really, really powerful research and evidence that is underused by industry. Thinking about how you actually get get that to people is extraordinarily important and you know stakeholder research is difficult but there are people out there you know who do you know who works in Tesco's head office you know think about how you reach um it organize individual organizations for different sorts of ways uh, and I think the final couple of things is sort of you know business leaders respond to a business case that they actually don't you know I, I, I shouldn't generalize about all business leaders but I don't think they really care what the segment is I think they care that you've got a big segment of the population here who are older consumers who are potentially powerful potentially influential and have spending power they wouldn't care if this is older people or younger people or a different group of the population so actually we need to be a little bit less precious about who the audience is but I actually really make the that business case and then once we've got them engaged respond promptly and in, engage um, I think the final advice is you know actually you know, the 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 big names aren't always the best so if you want you know if someone says to you know if you say I've got this brilliant idea for a new business I know what I'll phone Richard Branson you know it's almost certainly the wrong answer to any question that you're thinking of so um, uh, you know at uh, I suppose the final thing I'd say with the project we're doing, you're know, really, really keen to, you know, if you've done work on why every high street needs to have a public toilet to ensure older people spend, this is the sort of thing we want and need now so we can be getting those in front of businesses for you. So at that point, I'm going to stop. Thank you very much, David. And now on to our next speaker, uh, Susan. Oh, could I just check? Are there any questions for David? Uh, oh, sorry, because I have to, act to activate the, the, the audio. Okay, thanks, thanks, David. And uh, I, I see there are a, 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 a lot of comment in the chat, and I thank you, uh, all, all the people that uh, uh, give the, the, the comments. And uh, we go to the third speaker, that is Susan Walswars from Glo Global Coalition of Aging. Uh, Susan will describe the current contribution and potential member of, of Global Coalition of Aging for implementing the global policy goals. Susan. Thanks so much, Mario. I see that um, I think Rob's looking for my slides in here. They're a little further down. Um, but I, I would say, David, that I, I was thinking a little bit about what you were saying about having a toilet on every high street and thinking back to the sort of, you know, truism about universal design and the importance of designing, you know, how older, designing for older adults is really designing for everybody. Because I can think as a, as a parent of very young children, I would love to have a toilet on every high street or street, it would be fantastic. But um, I just wanted to take this few minutes to tell you a bit about who we are at the Global Coalition on Aging and how we're helping business engage with the decade. Um, so the Global Coalition on Aging or GCOA is a membership network of global companies who are thinking and acting differently about aging. So it is some of those big names. Um, we are the leading business voice on aging related policy, uh, bringing together a highly influential group of companies from across healthcare, pharmaceuticals, technological innovation, financial services, home care, and retail, um, to name a few, to work together on strategies that address the challenges and opportunities that come with global aging. And working together, we are aiming to influence and support a policy ecosystem for healthy aging at the national, global, and multilateral levels. And we 
do this by engaging and helping to shape the conversation in settings like the World Economic Forum, the OECD, the United Nations, and of course, not least, the World Health Organization. Uh, Rob, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So GCOA works with our members like Natalie and Homestead, who you'll hear from in a moment, and across our network with partners like David and the ILC UK and Mario and IEGG and the BSG and many others to raise awareness, to shape action, and really to drive innovation that will help to advance the goals of the decade across its four action areas. I think I'm actually off a slide. Okay. Um, in, you know, in recent years, both the UN and the WHO have increasingly begun to recognize, you can go back one. I was off one, thanks. To recognize the role the private sector can play as an important partner and stakeholder. Um, obviously that's something that everyone here today already knew or you wouldn't be here, but that was a bit of a revelation for those institutions. So through our long-standing work with the WHO's Department of Aging and Life course, GCOA has really become the de facto go-to resource for the decade's engagement with business, providing a voice to the private sector stakeholders who are actively collaborating towards the achievement of the decade's goals. Um, as an example, last month, our members sat down with the WHO team, you know, virtually, of course, and provided critical inputs into their midstream evaluation and towards the creation of a new and more ambitious communication strategy for the decade. You go to the next slide. Thanks. So what does this look like? One of the ways we do this is to share and amplify knowledge on a wide range of issues, including reframing financial planning, retirement, the future of work, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, caregiving, digital health, vision health, and adult immunization, to name just a few of the areas we're working in. We develop you know, white papers and reports on how these issues are impacting societies, how they interact with each other, and most importantly, what policy actions are needed at the country level and by regional governance to support healthy aging. You know, each of these initiatives that we work on is inspired by and driven by the dedication and vision of our individual member companies who have both expertise and interest in these areas. Uh, next slide, please. So throughout the year, we also host a series of high-level convenings, bringing together cross-sector experts and policy leaders to share knowledge, explore policy levers, and in really advance the thinking on issues at the intersection of aging business and society. And through doing this, we help to raise the priority level of certain target issues on a global policy agenda. That's the aim. Anyhow, next slide. So, and of course, we bring all of these conversations forward into the public arena through social media, blogging, op-eds, and partnership with subject matter experts, you know, including gerontologists. So in sum, these are just a few of the ways that GCOA members are driving policy momentum in support of the decade goals. Outside of the sort of specific defined policy arena, our member companies continue to experiment and innovate different solutions for healthy aging through their products, through services, their workforce strategies and community engagements. And this is really just you know, a quick snapshot or high level overview, but if you're interested in learning more about the details, please feel free to check out our website. I can drop it in the chat after and reach out with any questions. Um, also later on this year, we're gonna be releasing an official compendium or I think probably the first compendium um, that outlines and evaluates the individual and combined contributions of our members towards the achievement of the goals of the decade and through their specific initiatives um, as companies. Um, so thanks so much again to Ian and Rob for inviting us to participate today. And I'm gonna stop talking and see if there's any questions or I don't, maybe we'll go directly to Natalie and chat after. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, now I have the pleasure to present Natalie Almit, uh, from home instead. Uh, Natalie uh, will uh, describe the current contribution and potential for home instead owner to contribute to implementing the global policy goal. Natalie. Thank you very much, Mario. I'll just wait for my slides to get pulled up if that's okay. Thank you, Rob. Brilliant, thank you. Great, so by way of introduction, my name is Natalie Elmett. I'm the UK Communications and Advocacy Manager for Home Instead UK. 
Um, pleasure to be here and looking forward to the conversations as the session continues. Um, I just want to share a little bit of some of the work that we have going on at the moment at Home Instead UK, um, hopefully to spark some interest and some conversations about how we can work with the gerontology community to um, contribute towards global policy goals. So if you aren't familiar with Home Instead, I'll give you a whistle-stop tour. Um, we are the world's largest provider of adult care services, founded in 1994 and now operating in 14 international markets. So whilst obviously we're here with the British Society of Gentology today, um, the scope of work does go beyond our borders. Uh, next slide, please, Rob. We proudly serve hundreds of thousands of older adults every day. Um, and again, for context, these will vary from older adults seeking companionship or light touch support in the home to age well in place, all the way through to those living with increasingly complex conditions or needing palliative care. So we will do the full spectrum. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I thought it was really important um, to take stock, um, having come from a, a large conference today um, earlier and uh, at the Excel and being so excited to be kind of amongst colleagues and peers again to recognise that, um, you know, COVID significantly changed the way um, that we all worked for the last two years. And it also changed the way consumers and wider society are thinking about care, preparing for it, and more broadly, how they age. Um, and it really brought the importance of aging well into place into sharper focus than ever before. Um, but make no mistake, um, home care and providers like Home Instead and the work that we do um, still receives relatively little attention from policymakers and the media alike. All of the examples you see there are um, colleagues across the NHS and residential care um, being recognised for their support, um, but we were left out in the cold. Um, and we very much see gerontologists and your specialist knowledge being central to helping us as we move forward from the pandemic, paint a far more robust picture about what it takes to age safely in place, how to have more proactive and positive conversations about ageing well in place, um, with person-centred attitudes at the heart of that provision. Next slide, please. So as the largest um, provider of these services globally, Home Instead felt a real responsibility to lead research into sustainability and efficiency of home care provision um, in the UK to demonstrate its economic and health and societal value benefits and wider opportunities to policymakers. So one project I just wanted to spotlight today um, very quickly is our partnership with the University of York, DHSC and NHS England. Um, it's a body of work uh, spanning the course of three years looking at our model to provide both quantitative and qualitative data about how our services support and increase increasingly aging population with varying health needs to live safely at home. Um, while access to services does vary across our international markets, including how um, adults fund that care, we believe that if you see there the research into people living with conditions such as dementia or Alzheimer's and how actually services like this enable them to age safely in place for longer and with better outcomes is universally of interest to policymakers. Um, we're increasingly seeing DHSC kind of asking for examples from our portfolio of work in markets like Japan and uh, Germany in which we operate. So we hope that this will generate some interest. So looking through the lens of the Decade of Health and Aging act, uh, Action Areas, we intend to use this research to contribute to policy form in the UK and beyond about the cost, access to and quality of social care services specifically, and put forward recommendations to government about how such services could and should become the default care norm. We equally hope it will encourage colleagues in the NHS, perhaps over optimistically to embed some of this uh, learning and wider work uh, in their engagement with private providers such as Home Instead, who are an active part of these ecosystems to develop truly person-centered services and pathways of care. And researchers and gerontologists are central to the success of projects like this and dissemination of the research once published. So we see immense value in this group being able to support us to do so. Next slide, please, Rob. 
it's also worth mentioning that whilst we have this, this research programme active at the moment, and we do proudly invest in other advocacy work to not only expand the world's capacity to care and um, combat ageism, but also to promote the sector as one that provides fulfilling and rewarding careers for care professionals and ancillary staff. Um, so you may have seen on uh, Susan's earlier slide, um, we partnered with the GCOA to publish the Global Workforce Report last year, drawing on case studies and research from all of our international markets and this was uh, later presented at the OECD. In the UK for example and um, we're actively working with the King's Fund on guidance about the role of providers such as Home Instead in the newly formed integrated care systems and whether we should have a seat at the table and how best to amplify our voices to ensure that, that person-centered care remains at the forefront for people as they navigate their care continuum. And as David Sinclair mentioned as well, we're always looking at what more research we can do to champion this um, and the importance of aging well in place. So if there is something that you would like to explore with Home Instead, you know, we're always looking to be considered a test bed for new opportunities and new strategic partnerships of this nature. So please do get in touch. Um, I always like to say that a rising tide lifts all boats um, and it's so important that in a world where for the first time in history the old will outnumber the young, um, providers and businesses have an increased responsibility to use their platform responsibly um, and to invest in partnerships and research that is going to fundamentally make a difference um, to their consumers. So we're always eager to learn from peers and be used as a test bed, so please do um, get in touch if you'd like to find out more about our ways of working. And then lastly, a very short shameless plug, um, we will later this year um, very excitingly be launching the UK Ageing Alliance, um, founded by Home Instead, which is a cohort of retailers and businesses interested in sharing learnings at a C-suite level about the silver economy and grey market to develop mutually beneficial campaigns, share resources um, and strategies. We're intending to launch in September, all being well, um, and we already have Boots, Amazon, Barclays and Tesla go on board and um, so some of the largest high street uh, and online retailers not just in the UK but globally so again this if this is something you would be interested in hearing more about or supporting this work please do get in touch with me directly thank you very much thanks thanks uh, Natalie uh, this actually was a, a, a wonderful talk and uh, lastly I have uh, the pleasure and the honor to uh, present uh, Professor Jan Philp. Professor Jan Philp uh, is the founder of HK Technology. He's also the chair of uh, the SIG, and we have to thank him for this for organizing uh, this uh, this session. Jan will describe the HK Technology current contribution, the potential for implementing the global policy goal in partnership with the international research network that is creating. Thanks, Jan. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Mario. Uh, it's lovely to follow on from my colleagues and um, from Susan in particular, the work of Home Instead I've admired for many years because of its focus on personalised care for older people, which is central to uh, global policy goals now in the decade of healthy ageing. Um, as chair of the SIG, it's a huge privilege and honour to uh, uh, to be involved with this initiative and to work with my colleagues, Namrita, Rob, Mario, David, Susan, Natalie and Catherine, all of whom are contributing to today's session and to Debbie, George, Eric, Alison, Paul, Tim and Tina who are on the call and um, have led previous workshops. What a powerful leadership team to help change uh, the future of ageing. And to everyone else who's on this call, I think latest count is about over 70 uh, colleagues on the call. I really hope we can pull together to make a difference to older people's lives through the decade of healthy aging, through uh, business and gerontology communities working together uh, to help older people achieve greater levels of functional independence so that they are able to do the things which give their life meaning and to help extend healthy active life so that we have sustainable systems of care with uh, aging populations. But in my presentation, I, I want to focus on um, sharing with you my personal experience of working as a gerontologist uh, and then as a business leader to try and support both the development and the implementation of global policy goals for aging populations. Um, 
the development work started when I was um, uh, a, a medical student, when I was inspired to pursue a career in geriatric medicine at the same place which partly inspired my friend and colleague, Mario Barbara Gallo, working for Jimmy Williamson, uh, head of geriatric medicine in Edinburgh. And on Jimmy's retirement, he um, told me that he had identified a problem facing older people, which was that two thirds of the things which most matter to older people for their health, independence and well-being are not reported for a variety of reasons. And he said, I identified the problem. He identified it and published in The Lancet in 1963. But he said he hadn't solved the problem and he asked me to help solve that problem. I then had the good fortune of working in the United States with Bob Kane, the doyen of geriatric assessment, who helped me design a methodology that could translate the principles and practice of specialist, comprehensive, person-centered geriatric assessment into a tool that could be used widely for older people living at risk in primary care. Um, and then I, I had many years of undertaking international research and development with colleagues such as Mario in what was called the Easy Care Project to validate this approach. And spending the last 10 years aligning that work with World Health Organization goals, and indeed the work helping to shape the development of what has been published now by World Health Organization as the Integrated Care for Older People framework, the ICOPE framework, where ICOPE um, is a methodology or a framework to help older people report at an early stage problems in bodily decline, like vision, hearing, cognition, mobility problems, nutritional deficits, and psychological problems such as depression, as well as their concerns relating to social care needs and support, such as loneliness, accommodation problems, financial difficulties, uh, problems with activities of daily living, uh, problems relating to safeguarding and, and abuse. And that framework in part was influenced by the Easy Care Project with its focus on a person-centered approach to allow older people to report their needs and then connect to sources of support to meet their needs. In the last three years, I have switched hats to being a business leader as the founder and chief executive officer of Aged Care Technologies um, and felt that it was necessary to have a business approach to get this methodology out at scale, to generate the money, raise the income, to create a digitized tool that is easy to access, easy to scale, easy to use, and can be taken out globally to promote implementation of WHO ICOPE um, to deliver for older people a person-centered approach in preventive care and connect them to sources of support. Um, this tool is the only globally validated digitized tool that supports uh, uh, implementation of World Health Organization guidance. And we have a fantastic international research network doing validation and population studies with the tool with colleagues from, and I'll just list the countries, Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, Japan, China, India, Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, Poland, the Netherlands, Belgium, the UK, Italy, Portugal, Germany, Uganda, Canada, and Brazil. And I do invite other colleagues to join our network. Uh, the model we're using is to adapt the methodology for the local uh, situation, uh, how people um, contact and um, work with older people, validate it through feasibility studies, spread the model and evaluate it, and then scale with government support. The outputs for older people and for services are that we can identify the real needs of older people and make sure that older people get connected to local services and information resources to help them manage their problems. And um, for services, it can connect older people to clinical pathways. It can help with measuring the outcomes of interventions. And it helps determine the real needs, the patterns of needs, risks, outcomes, and trajectories for older people in their services. 
uh, the outcomes for older people and for systems are that for older people, we know the methodology can reduce suffering. And we know that on average, it can extend healthy active life by about a year uh, for each older person that uses the, the tool uh, or has the tool used with them. And for systems, we know that it improves population outcomes, helps reduce health inequalities across systems by bringing forward those older people who are most left behind to get their needs addressed and reduces absolute costs of long term care by allowing older people to live at home for longer with less needs for long term care and support. And for these reasons and for the potential benefit to improve the lives of older people globally, uh, we were very privileged to receive the inaugural United Nations Prize for Digital Innovation for Healthy Aging, the Wizards Prize. Um, I would like to extend an invitation to all colleagues on the call to get involved and work with aged care technologies as sponsors, partners, or as researchers, um, as a practical means to help implement global policy goals, to help older people improve their functional independence and be able to do the things which give their lives meaning. Thank you, Mario, for uh, introducing and thank you all for your interest in this topic. Thanks to you, Ian, for this uh, wonderful introduction. I do believe now it's 5.40, so we have uh, just in time for to, to split in the uh, breakout groups. I don't know if uh, Robs will explain what we have to do. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Mario, if it's okay with you. Um, we have four breakout groups for you today. Uh, we ask one question in four different ways. And the question is, how can gerontology and business work together to enable the decade of healthy aging? And the four different ways are thinking about the four frames of the decade of healthy aging uh, policy environment. And so these four frames, Catherine Foote will lead a breakout session around how gerontology and business can work together to enable the decade of healthy aging through tackling age discrimination. Ian Philp will look at developing age-friendly environments. Natalie will look at developing long-term care systems. Um, Mario will look at models of integrated care. What we really want from you in this session uh, is as much input as we can receive um, we would like to think about your experiences. Uh, we also would like to think about examples of best practice, what has gone well, uh, and remembering as well that best practice is not always about success. Uh, we can learn from failure too. Actually, a great article on LinkedIn about that today. Um, so, so with that in mind, um, I think we're going to try to uh, move um, to breakout groups now. And um, if that is okay with you, it might just take a moment. Um, they were all interesting. <laughs> Should we do that so, then? Should we take it from the top? Why, why don't we do that? And so I think maybe a first thing to do, um, if it's okay with everybody, I'm, I'm just gonna take over for a little bit. And I think that what will happen is, you know, we'll get into the conversation and I'll take a little bit of a back seat as we go. But I think maybe the first thing to do for everybody is if everybody in the room could introduce themselves, uh, it would be wonderful to know who you are and why you're here and uh, where you're from. Uh, so uh, we're really interested more than anything to hear from the audience at this point. And so maybe I could ask Domini if you would uh, start us off and I, I will walk through. Uh, yes, my name is Domini Lucas. I'm a translator, um, translating from Spanish and Greek into, into English, specialising in ageing. But I used to work as a healthcare chaplain and most of my life I've worked with older people and I'm hoping to do an MA in gerontology at some point. Caroline Needham. I'm um, a member of Ageable, which is a community interest company specialising in um, working to co-design services for older people. And I'm very keen on intergenerational work. The uh, Alice who set it up used to be my mentee. I used to be her mentor. I'm also passionate about play streets, which are an intergenerational space where people can come outside and meet their neighbors. How about George McGuinness? Ah uh, yes, uh, George Smith. I'm the challenge director for healthy aging. I'm also um, part of the sort of leadership of the um, special interest group. Nice to see you, George. Uh, Colin Lowe. 
Hi, uh, my name is Colm Lowe. I'm director of the Design Age Institute at the Royal College of Art. And um, as it says in the title, we take a design-led approach to solving the problems of healthy ageing. Uh, Alison Benzimra. Hi everyone, I'm head of research at United St. Saviour's Charity. We're a housing provider for all the people. I'm also involved in the leadership team for the special interest group. Sharon Rose. Hello, I'm Sharon Rose from Florida in the US. I am a social gerontologist with a focus on intergenerational communities and companies, as well as healthy aging and incorporating age tech into our business plans for the individuals and groups. Ashley Glachowski. Hi, my name is Ashley. I am a clinical exercise physiologist and researcher at the University of Manchester with the Healthy Aging Research Group. Oh, I'm from Manchester. It's a good place. Uh, Debbie Keeling. Talking Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm from Manchester too, so good, good to have everybody on board. I am um, at the University of Sussex and I am uh, also on the leadership team for this special interest group. By Breen Samuels. Okay, I think uh, Bybury might join us uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, Chris Ward. Hello there, I'm an innovation lead working for the Healthy Aging Challenge supporting George McGuinness. Hi, Chris. Claire Robinson. Hi, I'm working for um, Newcastle University at the National Innovation Centre for Aging. I've been taken on to develop the cluster for the Internet of Caring Things. So um, we're helping to design products that specifically connect and care about the things we care about, which could be anything really, but um, obviously aging and healthy living is part a huge part of what we're doing, along with Voice Global as well. So we get the user centric design as well. Hi, nice to meet you. Elaine Douglas. Hi there, I hope you can hear me. Can you? Yep. Yep. Oh, great. Brilliant. I've got new um, headphones on. So brilliant. OK, sorry, my camera's not working, but I'm Elaine Douglas. I am the Social Behavioural and Design Research Manager with the Healthy Aging Challenge. Hi, welcome. Um, Huned Nagaria. Hello. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm a, uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm a student at the Royal College of Art and I'm uh, studying aging and trying to design interventions for it. So I'm just here to kind of network and yeah. Welcome. Eric Kilstrom. Hi, uh, Eric Kilstrom with uh, Aging 2.0 and uh, various other projects, but uh, nice to meet you, everyone. Huned Nagaria. Hi, Eric. I think I just went. Yeah, I think oh, it's, sorry, it's, sorry, yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. No <laughs> Junji Huang. Hello, uh, this is Junji Huang. Uh, I'm a senior architect at Dementia Services Development Center at University of Stirling. I'm also a researcher at Dashka Project there. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Lucy Zableska. Okay, Margaret Zabo. Hey, I'm Margaret Zabo. Um, I'm actually on the line from Nova Scotia in Canada. Um, yeah, long way, cross pond. Um, I'm the research coordinator for uh, Live More Smart Tech, which is a large transdisciplinary age well project that is looking at uh, three things. Who are the people that might use technology in long-term care and in home care? What are the barriers and facilitators and how might we scale this in within health systems and in social systems? Um, I have the privilege we're using the aged care technologies instrument and working with Dr. Ian Philp, who is on our team. Prior to that, I was in uh, the continuing care world um, from a corporate perspective, but spent most of my career actually in business um, in change management consultancy. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Matthew Larivieri. Hello, yes, thank you. I'm um, great to meet you all. It's my first SICK event. Um, 
So I'm a lecturer in social policy at the University of Bristol, uh, formerly a UKRI innovation fellow looking at age tech and how to support the implementation for aging in place policies. So great to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Uh, Muthoni Kichu. Hello, my name is Muthoni. I am a medical gerontologist and a policymaker. I work in, I am from Kenya. I work uh, with the Kenyan government and I am here to learn how technology can help us uh, make healthy aging and aging a better process. So I might not be a great uh, tutor for that given the, the mess up with the breakout rooms, but um, nice to have you anyway. <laughs> um, Sonia Heidinger. Uh, Tom, Tim Crudus. Hey everyone, I'm Tim Crudus, a uh, researcher from the School of Health Sciences, University of Dundee, where we have a multidisciplinary group and uh, people, health and communities research group. And it's my first SIG meeting. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Tim Shakespeare. Hi there. Um, I'm a research and innovator with background in dementia research. I now work at Zinc, supporting academics to take an entrepreneurial approach to create scalable and sustainable innovations based on research as part of the UKRI Healthy Aging Challenge. And we're super interested in interactions between business and research, particularly in early stage innovation. Uh, Tina Woods, hi Tim. Hi everyone. Um, yes, good to be here. Uh, I wear a few hats, um, but have been very, very involved um, recently running uh, a social venture called Business for Health, which is looking to incentivize and measure the business contribution to health in three pillars. Workforce health being the first one, products and services being the second one, and the third being community um, and wider societal resilience. Uh, and this is all feeding into the work that we're doing to promote um, healthier lives for longer for people and reduce health disparities, which is our overall mission. So, um, and, I'm, and I'm on the leadership team as well. Thank you. Welcome, Tina. Um, Zara Quayle. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Zara Quayle. I'm a GP by background, but I'm currently the clinical scientific research lead for Care Vision's Healthy Aging and their platform Goldster which is aimed at promoting healthy aging for the over 50s through live and interactive classes in fitness, well-being and purpose. Uh, so very pleased to meet you all. And secretly, I'm scoping for peer reviewers for our wellness intervention pathway. So if anyone's keen to do a peer review, uh, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Now, I apologize to anybody that I have missed. Uh, please. Oh, hi. Hi, Bybreen. Hi, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Fantastic. Hi, I'm Bybreen. I'm a writer and self-taught technologist. And what I'm doing is researching and writing an introductory book for baby boomers at the interface of aging, age tech and technology, new technology in particular. Brilliant. Uh, is there anybody that I missed? OK, so it feels to me like uh, what we could start with in this session is to introduce uh, our workshop leaders who are well prepared, uh, but unfortunately don't have a breakout room to work in. So um, I wonder if we could start with um, our, our first workshop leader, Catherine Foote. And maybe, Catherine, if, if it would be OK, you could share some of the thinking about how you were going to approach this session. Um, and your question was, how can gerontology and business work together to enable the decade of healthy aging by tackling age discrimination? Thanks, to Rob. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, so I'm Catherine Foote. I uh, work for uh, one of the UK's biggest pensions companies. It's called the Phoenix Group. And I, after a career in charities and think tanks and research, I now find, find myself having made the transition, crossed the bridge to the private sector um, for the first ever time last year to set up a new think tank about longevity and its implications because Phoenix is a pensions company and therefore very kind of cognizant of, of what aging might mean for, for British society and for, and for individuals financial security in future uh, and is very committed to its, its broader social purpose and wants to, wants to be sort of doing the right thing and making a difference for society. I mean, I think Rob, I was going to keep it quite open because we were going to have a small group, of course, but I suppose I think there are two, you know, in my head, there are two boxes in which you can think about the contribution that business can make to tackling age discrimination. And 
one we've talked about, I think has been touched on quite a bit, which is the role of business in providing products and services. You know, the stuff business sells to consumers and the services that it can deliver for people and that, that it can make a profit from. But the other that perhaps we haven't got on too much yet and maybe might be worth a bit of exploration is the role of, of business as an employer. So I think there's huge scope for um, you know, large employers in, and, and small and medium sized uh, companies, but particularly perhaps for large employers who have sort of HR departments that are able to think about it, um, to play a really active role in understanding their own perhaps age bias in recruitment, in recognizing the immense opportunity that economic inactivity among older people around the world could be if you were able to attract them back into work and offer the sort of flexible and other opportunities that would attract, certainly in the UK economy, that's a real challenge we're facing at the moment, um, lack of labour market participation. So just put, putting that out there, does anybody want to talk about the role of business as an employer alongside the role of business as a well, provider? I can see immediately that you've got reactions yeah. in the audience. Um, uh, and actually, I, I noted uh, Bybrin Samuels um, nodding ferociously um, at this, and I wondered maybe, Bybrin, would you like to, to make a couple of comments about that? Rob, if I, get, if I can say something, uh, I, I will say that uh, the possibility to have uh, all, all the people together to have a, a plenary session may be an opportunity. Because uh, what I what I uh, realized from uh, uh, the uh, presentation of, of uh, the people that there is a wonderful a, a wonderful audience. There are people from very different background, and this is very important. So I I, I would suggest that uh, we get uh, uh, in, uh, ideas from from uh, uh, different uh, point of view because people from different uh, background will be synergistic and they will will give a, a, a different uh, uh, point of view from what uh, we we do in, a, in, in I'm in, completely in with you life. I think I think but from I, uh, you know what could have been a difficult situation I think we actually have a huge opportunity here and so I, I thank you for saying that very much, Mario. I couldn't agree more. Babrin, yeah. would, would you like to add your testimony? Yeah, no, no. I just no, 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 no. You, you, you go. I, I think, I think that you and Jan should should, should lead. The, but I, I would su suggest that everyone will say something on on what will be the, the possibility to help the WHO uh, uh, focus. On, on, on what we said before, ability of people all over the world, with people from, from uh, Africa, people from Asia, people from uh, Europe, to the ability of meet one basic needs, ability to learn, to go make decisions. I know there are people also working on dementia, people that it's very important. Uh, how, how can we help people to, 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 to build and maintain relationship? Ability to contribute. This is, I mean, the social. If, if we can get some idea from, from the people, this will be, I mean, a great result for the for, the, for this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that for you. Absolutely, Mario. I, I promise. I really want to bring Babrin in, though, and uh, if that's okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. I love this because um, back in 2007, I went to China and uh, undertook a research uh, report around the positioning of older people in society. And I went there just because in 2006, the UK government, you know, uh, launched legislation about age discrimination and looking at the struggles at the older end and the younger end. So that was 2006, seven, and here we are in 2022. And actually there's a grow, even more of a growing problem of the disconnect between businesses, which fundamentally are looking at their bottom line. You know, there are different, um, so you could have a social bottom line, but it's about the profitable bottom line and the lack of training and the investment that goes into older workers. And so what has happened over the last decade or so is that people who are in their late 40s and their 50s it's something I really struggled with was about being uh, reintroduced back into the uh, conventional world of work but there's a disconnect because there is insufficient uh, resourcing going into the retraining of older people. So I took it on myself, for example, whereby I took the self-taught route of becoming a software engineer and then was exposed to artificial intelligence and new technology just to keep abreast of where the world is going. But there are 
you know, millions of older people who are in their 50s, who've got chutzpah, who've, who've still got it going on, who still want to make a contribution, who are sharper, who are with it. So it's about, is there room for a confluence between governments um, and how are they actively implementing the digital transformation uh, strategy that's touching all generations because funding tends to be uh, focused towards the retraining um, of, you know, Gen, Gen Zs and uh, millennials. But yet there's a dearth of funding and training being put back into older generations who still want to enter the workforce. And then there's a sizable problem of not having um, a pension because we're living longer and as a result of living longer, but the pension contributions that have been made are really for the point if you can retire at 65, but what if you're gonna live for another 30 years? So I think there's a disconnect between the role of government as well as uh, business. You had a great phrase. You said, is there a confluence? And I, and I want to ask, um... George McGuinness and uh, people from UKRI, very much in the know here. Is there is there a confluence, uh, George, as you see it? I'm sure I was busy typing up oh, <laughs> in, okay. into the chat is, as well. Is um, there a confluence? Is there room for confluence between governments uh, and the implementation on digital strategy for generations? Uh, so, so I think so, and and I think it it links actually to what I just dropped in the chat that actually there needs to be a case for doing something, businesses um, can't generally just act out of largesse. Um, otherwise, they very quickly run out of um, road being a business um, and go bust. So, um, you know, there's, there's a huge role for government in um, setting the ground rules and the framework that allows business to, to, to access those opportunities. Um, in some ways, you know, I'll ask Tim to come in here because because Zinc's whole mission is is about saying that there is value to be derived from addressing big societal issues, um, but it but it, a single business acting on their own finds it very very difficult. So there will be some things where where where, where government and and digital roadmaps and things like that uh, by really, really really need to converge. Um, you know, we're not going to get people um, confident in using digital services unless there is an element of regulation um, and, and, uh, and standardization uh, around what, what's going on. And, and I've heard so much about that in, in the last sort of week or so. So maybe hand over to someone else to sort of further that com comment. You mentioned Tim. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to step in. I'd agree. So um, I think our, what we do really starts with recognizing there's real pain points for real people out there. Um, there's things that they want support with, there's things that would help make their lives better. Um, and I think understanding those audiences, so we did a report on um, kind of innovation for quality of later life and found that there's um, not enough understanding about the different markets and segmentation within that kind of older life category. So I think there's a confluence there between um, recognizing the opportunity and also tackling ageism, which is this isn't just one big group of people that are all the same, that are all age over 50. Um, there's a lot of different segments within that and they've all got different needs and there are different business opportunities within that as well. So I think having that more kind of nuanced understanding is part of tackling ageism, but also part of seeing the business opportunity and then also part of meeting people's needs. So I want to bring in, oh, Caroline, please. I would like to say that um, we need to understand more the lived experience of older people and the piece of equipment that I had most challenge with as an older person was my grandson's pram. And I think that uh, there is a real lack of understanding uh, So someone who wrote Teach Yourself Grandparenting and worked for the Grandparents Association, that one of the things which is a very favoured occupation by older people is looking after young children. But the people who design equipment for young children have an assumption that it's younger people um, using it. And I think that, I mean, for me, the challenge of getting on a bus with um, a pram that I was slow in folding up meant that the bus left without me. It's kind of challenges to everyday living that, that are very little understood 
grandparent care is bigger than nannies, nurseries, and au pairs put together. It's huge. We, a baby boomer generation, the first generation who have juggled work and childcare, and we want to help, but there are challenges in doing it. Thank you, Caroline. I'd like to bring in Natalie who has a hand up, and then I'd like to go to Debbie Keeling about her comment on the chat. Brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, is there anyone for the Centre of Ageing Better on this call before I shamelessly plug something that they're working on, which I think might be of interest because it ties into this. So um, I sit as part of a, a special interest group with the Centre of Ageing Better and it's precisely looking at this topic. So how can we address the skills gap, um, the labour crisis and ageism in the workplace and how to upskill that older workforce to ensure that they feel valued um, and you know can perform to the best of their abilities in jobs that are actually suitable to their skill set and not ones that they're kind of pushed into uh, later down their career pathway. Um, so there is a body of research going on at the moment that the Centre of Research is funded. I believe they're working with employers um, as large as the co-op, for example, a few NHS trusts, uh, Phoenix Group, Legal and General. So they've tried to take employers from loads of different sectors um, to look at their kind of ageing workforce and exactly um, what pain points they're experiencing to try and come up with some solutions to that. So I, I'm not too sure how advanced that body of research is along. Apologies, I was quite late coming to that group. But if anyone would like some more information or to be a part, it is an open group. Um, all meetings are open for, um, for anyone who wishes to attend. So please make yourself known to me and I can put you in contact with the Centre for Aging Better. Rob, do you want me to come in? Yes, please, Debbie, if that's possible. I yeah, of course, yeah. Um, uh, I, I was thinking, uh, as we were talking, just about the wider... Well, I'm going to talk about the UK, so this is not obviously applicable. The, the stereotypes change um, across countries, across cultures, but um, we've got some very embedded stereotypes about older people, and, and our, our whole... All, all the processes in place, and indeed, including policy, which Rory has put in there, and, and the infrastructure um, is almost like, like being a bit on a conveyor belt and you're almost dragged along and expected to behave in certain ways. And I think that it's um, it's not only businesses that that um, are embedded within that, but also consumer themse consumers themselves or people themselves. So actually, um, we all have a role to play in, in challenging those stereotypes. And um, I think presenting a really good role models in society, making those very visible. Uh, so um, I, I, we, we mentioned various companies, but I know, for example, Waitrose. Um, uh, you know, they 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 employ uh, people, uh, uh, more older people, uh, and who um, you know provide great customer service, um, are able to um, uh, you know deal with quite complex problems because of the life experience that they bring. But you know, just bringing those to the fore will help us to challenge those very embedded stereotypes. But there, there's quite a lot of change that needs to be brought about. So challenging the stereotype and embedded stereotypes, and I, and I think it it feels to me like I want to bring in Ian Philp at this point. You know, second workshop lead here was here to ask a question around uh, how business and aging can work together to improve the environment around aging, uh, age friendly environments. So. Ian, do you feel there's an interplay with what's being said here and, and this second frame? Well, I think it is very interconnected, but in my little bit of prep for thinking about how can business and gerontology work together to, to help develop age-friendly environments, I, I just wanted to posit two questions for colleagues to come up with either examples of good practice or suggestions. Um, one is about how can an age-friendly environment better promote um, social interaction to combat loneliness and isolation of older people? <clears throat> and second, how can an age-friendly environment enable older people who are challenged in their physical or mental capabilities to manage independently? Um, so what might be the solutions? What are the solutions people already have? in these two areas. Can I, can I throw that out to colleagues on the call? Yes, please. I mean, does, th taking these two pieces together and, and those brilliant questions, Ian, I mean, are there any immediate reactions from, uh, from folk? Rory, do you want to 
Rob, can I go ahead? Yes, please, Alison. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I uh, work for a charity in Southwark and we develop a new arms house. So we're developing quite an a interactive social housing for older people. And what I've realized in setting this up is that the local authority is under-resourced and often still responding to COVID. And so as working in the nonprofit sector, I'm starting to realize how important the private sector is in developing an age-friendly environment. The private sector, how important it is. Can you say more about that? The fact that um, it's not just about the charity sector and a local authority, um, that business definitely needs to play a more influential role in how a, a community is becoming more age friendly, particularly for all the people who have limited resources and, and a, a weak family support system. Thank you, Alison. I was going to, funnily enough, go to Eric Kilstrom, but I see his hand is up. Yeah, I mean, the classic example is BMW. I mean, BMW re -enabled the, redesigned their manufacturing line and productivity went up, uh, not just for the older generation, but for everyone. And, and I think, uh, you know, there are other examples. Uh, I, not everyone wants to work at McDonald's, but uh, it, it, McDonald's, the, the, the more productive uh, locations were one that with an age diverse uh, workforce. So, I, you know, those are some of the, the case studies. I think we need more case studies. And I think that's part of the, the conversation here. But I think, you know, uh, the, the evidence around age diversity and productivity um, really needs to uh, land because I think the ageism uh, addressing ageism in the workforce is what is the real barrier to drive it, it, but I, I, there's a question I have which is frankly what you know how much of this will solve itself in the sense that because it's such a tight labor market there are these people who have uh left the labor market but may return to the labor market because of need uh, you know I, the, I'm sort of waiting for evidence to evolve around that. Uh, can we attract these people back into the market? I think Catherine talked a little bit about it, but I, it'd be interesting to see what the evidence says. Well, well thank you for that, Eric. Um, I, I see that Chris Ward made a really interesting comment on here, but before we go to Chris, um, Yunji, um, I see that your hand is up. Thank you, um, Rob. Um, as, uh, as an architect, I think um, I have several kind of uh, ideas maybe <laughs> in this area. Um, first of all, I want to address a, a very important issue that the age-friendly environment is not just for physical environment, but also for social environment. So there are two separate kind of um, things we need to really bear in mind. Um, but from architect's uh, perspective, um, when designing age-friendly environment, there is several kind of uh, lots of research and um, practices already done in this area. Uh, we are from Dementia Service Development Center in University of Stirling. So we have developed, we have a long time uh, of record uh, developing a very uh, well-known system called Audit Tool to assess the environment, whether they fit the needs of dementia people. And this has been proved, uh, been very successful. And so we also, um, give uh, recognition of those uh, well-designed environment to promote their kind of uh, practice and, and to set up as example to other designers within this area. So this is a very interesting story. Maybe you can also check on our website to read more about uh, these tools. And we, are, we have developed uh, a new audit tool now, and it, was, uh, it is now, um, I think, going to be launched in next month. So very uh, just in time. And if you are interested, you can uh, look at it. Yep. I think we're very interested. Domino? Um, oh, sorry. sorry. I'll come to you, Chris, in a minute. I'll come to Chris in a minute. Do you want me to go Please. back? Please, yeah. Um, I just wanted to come at it from a slightly different end because I um, I grew up in a country where all my relatives were 80 and 90 and I had an aunt who was 100 and I've never had any issues about, about um, 
being older and I decided around 50 years old to, to go back to translating after many years and suddenly was completely flummoxed by all the tech. And I already use tech. I've got robots um, doing hoovering in my house. I've really benefited from Zoom. I'm, I've been on Zoom with Spain, Mexico, Venezuela since COVID. My husband's been teaching from home. But I also think that we, it's quite offensive that everything gets taken down to this common denominator. And it's, we talk about upskilling. Um, and of course we do have to learn the tech skills, but once we're starting talking about older people, it's almost not here, but everywhere that you go, it's almost as if there are no other skills, because if you haven't got the tech and you haven't got everything else, you have nothing to offer. And I think sometimes there isn't enough of sort of saying, but actually some of this tech is making people more stressed. It's causing them more backaches. It's causing them social media burnout. And actually some of the things that some of the older folk know about going out in the garden or getting out with your friends or doing some sewing or whatever, some of the skills that are coming back in order to get over the burnout that comes from some of this tech. So sometimes I think it's become so focused and so narrow on just tech being the only skill uh, and some of the other things get thrown out the window. And I think a lot of older people find that quite difficult. I mean, I now feel older, I never did. I'm 50, 56, but I mean, I never thought of myself old. It's only the tech that's made me feel that way. Nothing else. Yeah, it has a habit of that, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, so can I come to Chris? Uh, do, do you have a comment to make, Chris? Can we, we understand your chat comment? Yeah, I, I suppose it's an immensely simple point, and it's, 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 it's a popular piece of economics that people seem to be discounting to actually generate profitability at the moment. And, you know, we can see it with the rise of the little of the Aldis of this world. But I think a lot of people have kind of slightly frog-marched into reducing costs as the way of growing an organisation. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking that you just need a new influx of young uh, graduates coming into your organization at relatively low costs. And we do see the constant debate around uh, minimum wage, obviously. And, and who wants to talk about minimum wage? Nobody should be wanting to talk about minimum wage as the route into any career. Um, and I can see there's an interesting tension here about whether older people are going to be seen as what I would describe a value employee, so they actually bring pound for pound better bang for their buck, or whether they could become the new discounted proposition where people say, well, let's get in some older people and, and we should be able to, you know, uh, fill some of our harder vacancies. And so that there's going to be a natural tension there. But um, I used to be a director at B&Q, so it was very interesting to hear Catherine's conversation about retailers and also employers full stop just representing um, an older workforce and, and, and what that was about and older employees we used to actively look for over 50s to work in effectively sales oriented roles in retail because they generated more profitability um, the, the classic classic example I can bring to life is um, when we were training people we followed you know, it was a guy called Ted in the Farnborough store. And that's so all I'm going to say, I'll, I'll, I'll personalise it to actually make this land. Somebody would come in the store and say, I want to buy a tap. And uh, a green um, employee might say, go to aisle seven. But Ted would take them to aisle seven and say, who's going to be using the tap? And they say, oh, it's going to be my older um, uh, mother. Oh, right. Interesting. Well, this tap would be better than this tap, because actually, as you get older, you know, we find some of these things harder to use. And, you know, can I ask where it's going to be used? Oh, it's going to be used in a new conservatory or sorry, a new um, uh, extension that we're building. Ask oh, so you're building an extension for £10,000. Now we've got a conversation going. And it was profound difference in salesmanship, but it came from some life skills. Um, so I think there's definitely this conversation about moving to a value model of employment rather than a cost-based model. So as simple as that. Brilliant, Chris. Thank you so much. I mean, I feel like I want, as a, such a you know significant employer and a and a mover and uh, a fast mover in this space, I feel like I want to come to home instead, actually, and see if there are any thoughts on that. But I also, if uh, Natalie, you could take a moment to also talk us through the third question around long-term care. Uh, I noticed that uh, there were some comments uh, from Sterling uh, around dementia services, et cetera, and it felt to me like that was an appropriate uh, point to segue to your third section. Sure, uh, absolutely. I mean, Homestead finds itself in a slight conundrum at the moment. Uh, most of our care professionals are, are female, uh, and most of our care professional uh, 
uh, care professionals in our network are sort of late 40s, early 50s, early 60s. That's sort of the standard uh, profile of a caregiver. And I think it would be fair to say that's, you know, comparative to our franchises in, in Europe and in the US as well. So obviously in, in recent years with that demographic leaving the workplace altogether, we found ourselves um, for the first time kind of really challenged to service some of our clients. So, I mean, if we're waking up to the, to the uh, age and skills drain, I think many other employers are. But for us, it's now focusing on retention and designing career pathways that are more suitable um, for people, depending on where they are on that, um, you know, that, that, that continuum, be they just starting out or, or later life. Um, Sorry, Robert. Sorry, Natalie. So, so tell us about the session that you were we were planning to have today, and the the, the question. And, Great. And... Yes. Apologies. Um. So, looking at long term, uh, healthcare systems. And um, again, I was going to leave it relatively open and draw on everybody else's expertise. Um. In in this, so I don't know whether there's anybody who wishes to kickstart us off, or who has any thinking about that. I see that you have an immediate uh, Caroline Needham there. Um, I just wanted to say that um, there is a real uh, difference around um, how different uh, people view care work. And I think that one of the things that really needs to be done is to raise the profile of care work and the image of care work. And I, I mean, I really do feel that um, there's a lot to be done in, in terms of obviously pay, because that is an issue. And I think it's an issue that's political. Um, I'm a former councillor and we are the only borough in the entire country, Hammersmith and Fulham, that provides free domiciliary care to our residents. And that was um, funded, 50% of it was funded by completely abolishing all the assessments of people's uh, incomes. You, you do that and you free up money. Also, it meant we could get care to people earlier and there were huge advantages in uh, a system which actually was easier to navigate, quicker to get to people, and actually our care workforce really like it because they are working for an employer that provides it for free. Oh, abs absolutely. Just to just to comment on that on that quickly. Um, you know, I I feel very passionately that across the sector we need to improve a lot of the care professional um, particularly in home care this is a hidden army that go into people's homes in our case not wearing uniform so they're often kind of the unsung heroes of their community they didn't get you know the clap on the stairway or on your balcony during the time that NHS workers did and yet they were doing absolutely critical work in communities keeping people keeping people safe and keeping people well so I completely agree um, Caroline it'd be great to, to pick up separately about some of the initiatives that we're working working on for our workforce and um, I'd love to see um, your and hear, and hear your point of view on that and see if that resonates with some of your work as a counsellor and opinions and, and feedback you were hearing from people um, during your during your work there thank you. George I, McGuinness, I'm no longer um, a counsellor but I can feed it in. <laughs> great thank you. George and then Margaret Zabo. Yeah uh, uh, I was going to sort of just reinforce the point that I think the the model of congregated settings in all their various forms is is broken whether that's care homes and i know from personal experience i, I feel that my mother was held uh, in worse conditions in some ways than a prisoner in solitary confinement um, in a care home during covid um, really interesting to see uh, people writing in the states about how some of the retirement communities who had built their model around um, you know the sunshine years of, of retirement suddenly now not really working that 50 percent of their residents are actually beginning to need home care and and and, and more dedicated care um and uh, you know i don't have any immediate answers but we know what people really aspire to which is remaining connected to their local communities living at home um living in your own home isn't always an option um but we've also beginning to find things like 
care homes linked with nurseries actually are good for both the children and for the older people. So trying to understand how we move out of what we've got into something that is more connected and intergenerational um, and, and more respectful. And, and, you know, I couldn't agree more with Natalie about the need to, it's not professionalized because I think they're very professional. I think it's recognized the professionalism of the people working in this sector. I know that we have a delegate here from the Sunshine State. And so I'm, I don't know, Sharon, if you want to speak uh, after Margaret, but please, Margaret. Just listening to the very um, fascinating comments that are that are going around the table, it, it makes me wonder about the concept of complexity and how comfortable we are with the concept of complexity. And I think I've spent my career in business, I've spent my career in healthcare systems, I've spent my career in universities, I've been in charitable organizations, I've worked in every different area. And one of the things that I find is that to, to support change on the level that we're talking about, I think we really need to examine complexity. We need to learn and understand, it, it's not about how do we engage business. Business is not one uniform character or, or one uniform type of people or, or focus, any more than older adults are all the same. And you know, I think it really brings us back to a very transdisciplinary requirement that we engage people from all different backgrounds um, whether they be content or experiential experts uh, and really having seen in the project that we're working on in Canada right now and, and with Ian, the importance of a personalized approach because when we look at success, it really comes down to how do we quickly and efficiently evaluate what that individual needs, whether it's for the purposes of profit, social investment or whatever. And then how do we bring in the right kinds of people to address those issues? So for example, when you look at businesses on our partnership, we have commercial partners, a variety of them, which we could not have done what we're doing with just academic partners or with just social care partners. Um, and people think differently and different types of people think differently. So I think we have to find ways to make it, to deal with complexity, to address these issues. And, and to recognize that it's never going to be one size fits all. And I'll give you an example of the gentleman who was the architect. When you're trying to apply for funding for a new care facility, it's almost impossible. People understand through the great work at Sterling, for example, the design um, aspects of how to support social engagement, but there is no understanding in long-term care or, or in most um, government or health systems that I've seen that people expect, older adults expect that technology will be available for them as they move through these different phases in life. And particularly with the IoT aspects and opportunities that are there, we now have people who are severely disabled with profound issues using IoT and love it and would not give it away. And it's reduced that prison walls that come with COVID and we're seeing huge success. But the reality is we needed 36 people coming from various different backgrounds and we needed national and, and local government support as well as on the ground point of care to make this happen. And so I think it's time that we all understand that people coming from different areas have something to add and we need to spend our time if we're going to invest understanding the various different models rather than blaming business for something or you know assuming that because you have a charitable number, I mean, that's really your tax your tax form, it's not, it doesn't reflect who you are as a company. And I think it's really important to take the time and really understand what motivates people so that you can bring them together for the great game. I really thank you for that testimony, actually, Margaret, because I think as well that it speaks very much, uh, you know, not, not just in terms of age-friendly environments, but also speaks to the idea of integration, the integrated care uh, that can be developed. And so, so with that in mind, I, I'm gonna move over there in a minute uh, but I do want to come to Sharon if if you've got any comments about what was said about, uh, you know, the US. Changes. <laughs> Changes. The reason I joined this, this international platform is because it gives me hope, <laughs> inspiration, that we're all doing what we're doing to make the difference. And there are two items that I'll briefly come up with because I know we're at the end of our time. One is culture change. We need to, to bring that into our community. I, I'm an intergenerational focus person. So if we can bring the culture change in the communities and in the businesses from the beginning, 
from mentoring and then mentoring up and down, meaning up and down the ages, and then started at the very beginning in school and in, in the starting points of various types of businesses, allow people to go on their projects and take some time off and then come back again so they're rejuvenated, so you're not imprisoned in this two week or one week vacation. Um, so that's one piece of it. And then the other piece of it is from the top down and the bottom up that we have the implementation of coaching to the specific job, to the social interaction. So the silos are gone, we're around the same table. It could take a generation of time, it could take 10 years time it's the fact that we need to go the full picture and instead of one piece and one piece and one piece it's, it's to go and see the whole picture and, and all of us here and more to make that happen and thank you thank you so much for that sharon a really helpful remark i i do want to move across now to uh, bring mario back into the conversation uh and just to say that i think we're due to close this session at 6 p.m so we've got another half an hour and I, I think that what we'll do, Catherine, if it's it's okay with you, I think you've heard uh, Catherine Foot. I think you've heard a, a really vibrant conversation here. So I do still want to come to you uh, maybe in about 10 minutes or so to, to get some observations from you. And then what we'll do is we'll ask the leads of the projects to come back and reflect. Um, but with that in mind, if it's, if it's okay with you, um, I'd really like to bring Mario back on and we were gonna have Mario lead a session uh, on how gerontology and business can work together uh, to enable the decade of healthy aging through developing models of integrated care. And of course, these workshops were all facilitative. So I'm not expecting, you know, huge amounts, but I, I would love to know, Mario, what, you know, what your plan, what you were thinking about for that session, or if you have any comments. No, my, I mean, one, one, one of the comments from very, from this very interesting uh, discussion was actually one of the po main point of the uh, ten, the decade of healthy aging is to change the way we think about aging, because there, 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 there is still a lot of. Uh, um, uh, ageism, uh, because because it, uh, our world is made for young people, uh, and uh, we need young people. They don't they don't uh, understand uh, that they will they will get old, and old people they 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 uh, are in, in some way they are excluded from from uh, most most of the the work the job uh, the way you know, the the environment is, is made and uh, actually the, the two years we passed with the pandemics actually gave a great contribution to this um, to to this uh, change of uh, attitude because all the people were mostly excluded because the, from uh, uh, the 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 society and the social environment Actually, I, I have just to. Uh, uh, I just want to to um, uh, remind. We we made a, a, a short uh, research on people that uh, uh, we used to to come to our to our clinics, and of course during the pandemics, we uh, all, all the all the visits were were closed. So at, at we 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 uh, made some uh, interview. Uh, on uh, on uh, uh, people that used to come, in particular in in uh, were diabetic subject, and I remember that uh, um, uh, if, if we interview a, a, a one hundred people, and uh, ninety nine of one hundred were uh, depressed, so depression is uh, one of the main. Um, uh, um, things we have to think about uh, this pandemic uh, uh, of the, the not only the long COVID because uh, also people that were not uh, in uh, were not uh, affected they they were depressed and of course this because loneliness uh, absence of uh, uh, interest also contribute to that if uh, if, if you think about ninety nine percent of people. Uh, of our uh, small sample were depressed means that 
uh, if it will be not 99, maybe 90 percent. I mean, so there's a lot we should do the way uh, we uh, uh, may change the people because they are the, one of the other action is uh, make old people to contribute. So uh, of course, the, the, all, all this this free action, the way we think about uh, all the people, uh, the the way all the people are uh, in some way neglected and, and depressed, and uh, the the uh, lackness of uh, make people to contribute, are all all make one uh, uh, they, they they are synergistic to 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 the, to the things that we have to do something uh, to to make uh, uh, people all the people want more active so the social environment i do believe is the most important action in on we we have to, we have to do in in in, uh, in this in this decade and we have to make uh, action on on government on society on on there are a lot of uh, uh, association and uh, i do believe we, we have to to uh, uh, to 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 make uh, um, uh, older people to to be part of our of, of our uh, action i don't Mario, know if thank you so much on that Thank you so much for that. I, I'm really curious to know and if there are any delegates in the UK here from integrated healthcare systems. Uh, I'm thinking particularly we've got a few people here from Man Man Manchester, you know, which is probably a leading edge system. Uh, but I'd really like to understand uh, what they see the state of integrated care in, in the space is. I mean, is this something that we, we, we have blocks to be able to, able to achieve or, or or is it something that's just slowly developing i mean i'm really interested in any thoughts on on the challenges uh ian yeah th thanks rob i'm <clears throat> i'm involved with uh, nine integrated care systems in england at the moment and with people that are promoting integrated care um in many countries around the world i think the time has come i i really think policymakers uh, have got it that given the point about older people being very complex, point Margaret was making, um, and needs don't easily fall into one or two areas, the, the only way we're going to respond effectively to a very old um, people, and the many old people in society is to recognize that complexity and integrate products, services, support, uh, around their needs. I, I think the time has come and it's the central plank, plank of the healthcare transformation agenda and in the UN decade is integrated care. Um, and in England, and I think in many other uh, care systems, integrated care is moving fast. It's moving fast in Singapore. The Agency for Integrated Care there has been set up by the National Government of Singapore to drive this as the central reform to healthcare systems. And aligned with integrated care is a focus on prevention. Um, so getting upstream, because we can't, um, we can't deal with aging societies if we just leave it to crisis. We have to be working alongside and activating older people as positive forces in society, economic net contributors, um, moving the idea from burden to opportunity with aging societies and so on. And I think policymakers get it. I think um, businesses increasingly get it. And certainly the silver dollar, as it's called, is strong. 80% of the world's disposable income is in the hands of older people. We live in a gerontocracy economically. And so business has to respond to that. And I think researchers can really help understand the nature of complexity, the nature of need in old age, um, and um, how population aging is affecting society in so many profound ways. So um, I, I just wanted to build particularly on the comments of integrated care. And I, I, I see that as really, person-centered approaches to integrate care products services so i want to go to tina in a minute and thank you ian i think those comments are so helpful and interesting i mean one of the things i feel as though this conversation has almost come in like full circle 
it's, it's maybe almost going back to that whole piece about the first workshop conversation where there were comments about, um, you know, the sort of negativity around the cohort and the need to make a case uh, about the opportunity uh, of aging and uh, healthy aging. And I, I just wonder if there is a, an economic argument here that, that sits within health and social care that keeping people, and if, if that is, you know, part of what is th this health and wealth thing, I suppose, is where and maybe it's specifically around cost in social and health care. And, and I, it was within that that I just wanted to put some context for Tina and, and to see if she had any particular comments about that as well. I, I just wanted to uh, just uh, build on, on what Ian has just said, just through some reflections from a recent project that I just finished, which was fascinating. It was a, a project uh, in one of the new emerging uh, integrated care systems in, in uh, the Sussex area. And we did a piece of work really asking, you know, the local people, residents, local businesses, employers, community groups, you know, what they felt health, the health offer should be and the role of the NHS and care system. And so we had a report come from, you know, the, clin the clinical side, and then we had a report informed of this. We tried as much as possible to take an ethnographic approach and really, you know, spoke to people, especially those who don't generally sort of, sort of co contribute to these sort of discussions and the, the gulf between what <laughs> what the sort of the ICS people felt was needed and what the communities felt, oh gosh, got a big, someone's, sorry, a bit of noise out there. Um, what the community felt was needed was absolutely gigantic. And so, uh, so that um, input was fed up and it was quite a, an eye opener actually. I mean, we had many local businesses who did in a huge amount, you know, to, to you know, in, in, from, uh, in, in mental health, for example, you know, certainly during the pandemic, and they took on a huge burden of that role in their local communities and the whole way that the communities sort of bound together to kind of address, you know, to try and make the communities better and the role that people in nurseries and schools, local businesses, I mean, they had, a, they, they do a huge amount, which is unrecognized, not measured, not captured in many of the metrics that we use. And so it was quite an interesting project, which I think has opened up um, a lot of it, it's opened up a lot of attention on how we need to actually really find out uh, what the people in the communities really think and involve them in the solutions. So I think that's one, uh, one point that I just felt was really important uh, to make. And I do think uh, through the, the, the work that I'm doing at Business for Health, and we're really looking at community resilience as one of the pillars of, um, of, of health generation in, the, in terms of this bit, index that we're developing. Um, and there's a lot of attention, you know, on the role of local business, local employers as anchor institutions like retail, for example, they could have a huge role to play, um, you know, in that, in that respect. And so, so I think that's a really, really interesting space. And I think this need, and I think this openness now uh, to, um, you know, care, uh, health and care systems to work in collaboration with social enterprise, with local businesses is really opening up. I mean, that's certainly the feeling I get, you know, speaking to like NHS Confederation and then also speaking to, to groups on the ground. So I think it's a really interesting time. And I think, um, but I do think uh, people within the ICSs, they really need to go outside and really listen to what the communities need uh, to develop and prosper. Thank you, Tina. Debbie? Um, yeah, I mean, building on both of those points uh, that from Ian and, and Tina, I think for, for integrated care to work, we need people to have confidence. We need people because they may have to um, uh, control or manage access to their own data, for example. And the um, ageism is incredibly devaluing and uh, bashes down people's confidence or or perceptions of themselves as their ability to take part in in integrated care and so we're actually it, it, with aging is actually defeating um the the opportunities that we have with integrated care particularly people's recognizing people's individual role in that Okay, so are there any more comments that we'd like to make? Because what I'm, I'm sort of thinking about doing now is maybe asking Catherine if she'd like to walk us through any observations that she may have on the wider conversation that we've had here and, and the meeting, of course. Um, I don't want to, I know it's been a, a, a slightly challenging uh, event, Catherine, so I, I don't know how well you've been able to do with it. George has raised his hands if you'd like another couple of minutes. I, I can uh, ask George to, uh, to make his comment. Uh, uh, just very quickly following up on, on Debbie, so th this promise of integrated care uh, actually 
uh, will only be realized if people actually understand how to move value around the so you know move move money around the system and value around the system and and you know if i look at social prescribing today it's an investment in lots of coordinators looking for free services well that's not actually going to get anyone out of bed and doing something that you actually have to try and find some some way of of recognizing the value that those services are providing and and point people toward you know point people or help people access them and i think we're just on the cusp of thinking about that but but that there's a there's lots of promise yet to actually convert into something that business can really relate to and eric yeah, I, I mean, I, I, um, I believe integrated care is quite important, but I, I have to say I, I hold my breath in hope that it works out for the best. But I'm, there's parts of me when I, I hear NHS stand up and say, if there's any doubt about who's making decisions about care, uh, let me alleviate any of those concerns. NHS is driving the bus and social care is very much in the back seat along for the ride here. And um, I'm quite concerned about medicalizing care. Uh, you know, I, 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 a lot of the stuff that we talk about prevention agenda is very important, at, but not necessarily something that NHS invests in. So I, I, I got involved in a charity called Open Age because NHS actually did fund uh, some prevention uh, activities. And, I, and I'm really interested to replicate that. So I, I think there's an opportunity, but um, we, I, I, we need to be vigilant to make sure that prevention is on the agenda and it's not medicalized because it, I feel right now the train is headed toward medicalized. All right, that's duly noted, Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, Catherine, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. And can I just say, Rob, that was like an absolute masterclass in dealing with a problem in the moment and chairing um, an enormous conversation in one go. I loved how you segue through the different workshops. Um, so I just needed smoothly. two minutes, I needed to 10 seconds ahead of the crowd, that was all. <laughs> what a superstar. No, very impressive. Um, well, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to reflect on all of our behalves. I mean, clearly a very wide ranging conversation. And I think, I suppose, my reflections, I thought perhaps I might focus in the time that we've got on a couple of minutes worth of reflections on what this might mean for the special interest group in particular, and where the agenda and work of the special interest group might go and where its energies might be best placed. I think it's striking to me how much um, in conversations like this, we do as a group of individuals inevitably gravitate towards, you know, the policy questions, the challenges, the issues, the content of the, of the conversations about these four global challenges as much if not more as we do about what it means for the relationship between gerontologists and business so I suppose that reflecting where the energy was in, in this particular conversation makes me wonder whether one potential route on the table um, for this for the special interest group could be to choose to focus on a particular policy area to focus on the connection you know one of those goals um, to recognise that there's particular energy in health and social care and integrated care and long-term care and collaborate on solving a problem together between you know, using convening power to bring gerontologists and business together to work. Clearly there are obvious partners in the room like the Global Coalition on Aging and Susan, there's David and ILC, there's Zinc, there's Innovate UK, there's all sorts of people that are great at doing this that, that the, the special interest group could really actively collaborate with on taking a particular problem and applying, you know, I mean, gosh, Colm and and uh, and Tim will be much better versed in some of this, but you know, sort of private sector design sprint kind of attitudes and, and methods to, you know, what can what evidence can gerontology bring to a you know a business opportunity and a something that is both a business opportunity and a, and a policy problem. Um, I think the other thing that strikes me is that when we have spoken about business and um, uh, and, and, and the role of business, we've perhaps thought about it 
discussion has seemed to be in a, in, you know, in, in, a, in a couple of camps. There are those of us here who, if, if you like, present the kind of, you know, the early adopters of this agenda. Um, but there are a mass of, uh, you know, of business and the economy who aren't engaged. And I think some of David Sinclair's comments in the chat actually were, were challenging us to recognize how um, perhaps for a lot, an awful lot of industry, we still, we've yet to change the weather of the conversation about the opportunity that older consumers present or the opportunity that older, older workers um, present. You know, Mario, your point about the, you know, the broader social environment and the importance of focusing on trying to, trying to make change there. So I suppose that's a totally other sphere of influence you could choose to move into. The DAPs that would be about, you know, pushing, leading individual gerontologists um, working with their university press offices and trying to get them in the, you know, get them on platforms, get them in the media, get them talking much more, get get gerontology a uh, much great, you know, get get leading gerontologists a much bigger public profile in challenging ages and talent challenging stereotypes. You know, get get more of that work out there. Totally different um, approach. And then I think I just I did also finally want to suggest a third, again entirely different angle, which would be to pick up on some of the specific examples that people have given, where they've talked about individual successes and individual relationships. And I suppose the other thing that strikes me is that you know you can have this conversation in the abstract, in the sort of faceless, nameless abstract, gerontology on the one hand, business on the other, or you can recognize actually that these are all people. And what really makes people have those light bulb moments, those Damascene conversions, those, those take those different decisions, is if they meet people and are convinced by people. And so I suppose the third and final opportunity would be for the SIG to get really involved in, you know, individual level matchmaking, building connections between not just the professors, but the early career researchers, not just the business leaders, but the, you know, the middle managers um, and building those very specific and supporting those very specific and personal connections that, um, that will actually, I think, genuinely open the doors and ultimately make the difference. So just a few thoughts from me, Rob, there you go. Wow, now that was a masterclass. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Now, I, I felt like it's really important at this point now to go back to the workshop leads and ask if there were any reflections on what Catherine had to say. And Ian, I'd ask you to keep your powder dry until the very end um, of, of the group, uh, because I really feel that what's been said here is about the SIG and, and for you to reflect on that. So if we could start with uh, Natalie, um, it would be, be wonderful if you've got any uh, additional comments or remarks or observations, reflections. Sure, absolutely. I'll try and keep this quick. I know we're short on time. Yeah, we're um, my yeah, my first my first one is just a massive thank you to to Rob and Ian for organising such a wonderful session. I've had a brilliant time um, discussing this with you all, and thank you for those who have reached out already. And I hope we can continue the conversation. Um, just reflecting on on Catherine's masterclass summary, um, I, I had two kind of key things for me there. Those individual relationships are absolutely key. Um, I, I, I think to this. So the role of playing sort of matchmaker. Um, sounds like quite good fun and also that it would be very fruitful for a lot of us on this call so really interested to see how we could maybe take that forward and a body of work uh, around that absolutely and then also about identifying those specific policy goals that we can work on together to bring different perspectives different backgrounds across academia business etc um i think breaking sort of breaking that down and taking that away to reflect on is certainly what i'll be doing this evening um so yes thank you for summarizing catherine that was wonderful Fantastic. And um, then I'm just uh, looking around the room to see who else we've got. Uh, do, is um, Mario, are you still with us? There we are. There's Mario. Uh, Mario, do you have any comments or additional remarks? No, I think it was a great discussion. No further comment. I will suggest uh, uh, the chair, Jan, to conclude the session. It's, we are three minutes away. Absolutely. And so, Ian, could I ask you to reflect, but would uh, you also be kind enough to walk us through the next couple of months of, of, of the activities that I'm happy to do it, but if, you, if you'd like to do that, you can close the meeting. Well, thanks, Rob, and thanks everyone for last in the course. We Nearly half of the people who started are still on the call, so well done. It's been like a, a commando training course or something, because there's been so much great stuff shared and ideas. Part of our responsibility as a SIG is to capture this discussion. So we will create a set of notes based on the recording of this discussion. And out of that, we will pull together 
a report of all the ideas that have been generated here and at the other two workshops, as well as some key recommendations. And I, I couldn't agree with Catherine more that we have to focus then on the SIG leading on one or two things uh, for the year ahead. And that will be our challenge. What will be the one or two things that the SIG could focus on with this wonderful uh, community of, of knowledge, skill and experience to make a difference to support implementation of one of the policy goals? What are the one or two things we can do to help gerontologists work with and in businesses to pursue their careers? And what are the one or two things we can do to help businesses connect better with the social gerontology community? That's the challenge for the SIG and, and all of our work from now on will be distilling the wisdom from this um, session and the other sessions into a set of recommendations and actions which the SIG itself, with the generous sponsorship from UKRI, will be able to um, take forward next year. Um, everybody who's contributed and joined these calls will be de facto invited members of the SIG. We will be a, com a community of interest. People can put themselves forward into leadership roles to lead particular work in future. So I'm looking forward to working with you all. I just want to add thanks to Rob and Namrita who did all the hard graft to prepare for this session. Um, to Natalie, Mario, Susan, um, Catherine, um, David for uh, leading work today. Um, everyone's brilliant. <laughs> uh, truly everyone's brilliant. Everybody who's contributed is brilliant. We've got things that we can do. We've got some agency and I, I just hope the SIG can be a vehicle for translating the brilliance of everybody who's a member into making a difference. Uh, one way or another and that's the challenge we will we will take on with relish and we'll be inviting you to a final workshop around uh, September um, between now and then we will be reporting at the British Society of Gerontology annual conference in a special session for the SIG so we will share with the wider gerontology community and there's one or two other things that we'll be doing as well but um, Namrita will be in touch with you through the communications work to just let you know what's going on and how you can contribute in future. But most of all, thanks for, thanks for your contributions, everybody from around the world. Um, uh, thanks for making this a great workshop. Um, so have a good day, afternoon, evening or night, depending what time it is, day of the world, and we'll see you again soon. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.